others who have given this lecture have then gone on to perish. So I'm taking it very seriously. I wore black for you. I don't normally wear black. But um, she introduced me, and those are my, my positions. Um, my email isn't working very well. If there's a wizard among you, maybe uh, you can help me. But uh, I'm very grateful that you've come. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm grateful that the Common Land has sponsored my work. Uh, and I have to be thankful for many organizations because over the last 20 years, I've been allowed to continue to follow this line of inquiry. And you may not know what I do, but I, I may know something if you've looked at VPRO and seen some of the videos that have been made. But I study function and dysfunction in terrestrial ecosystems. And it's been an interesting journey for me because I uh, left university to become a television cameraman for the news and I worked for CBS News for about a decade and then Radio Televisione Italiana and then Zweites Deutsches Fernsehen. And um, I covered really big geopolitical stories. China was poor and isolated when I first went there. And the collapse of the Soviet Union was pretty interesting. But uh, in 1995, the World Bank asked me to film the baseline study for the Lus Plateau Rehabilitation Project. And what I saw was that over historical time, this place, which had been the cradle of Chinese civilization, had been fundamentally ecologically destroyed. This is actually Lus. It's a windborne sediment. It's created by the movements of glaciers high in the Himalayas and then deposited by wind on the plateau below. It's very minerally rich soil, but it requires organic matter to be fertile. The area is approximately the size of France, 640,000 square kilometers. And these deposits are very deep. And if you dig around in there, you might find some interesting things because this is the cradle of Chinese civilization. The Han, the Qin, the Tang dynasties were all based in this, in this region. This is to the southwest. It's a fully functional forested system with water biodiversity. It's wonderful. And if you go to the northeast, you find a fully functional grassland system in Mongolia. There's a lot of evidence that it was in a mixed forest and grassland ecosystem that the Chinese race emerged. And it's very much like the Rift Valley in Africa. And according to the Chinese, there's evidence of humans and their ancestors for about a million and a half years in this place. That's compared to five million approximately in the Rift Valley. And most experts believe this is the second place on Earth where human beings began to do settled agriculture. But in 1995, when I went there, it was a ruined landscape. It looked like the moon. And <clears throat> I couldn't believe that the largest ethnic group on the planet came from a place which was fundamentally ecologically destroyed. And I didn't know very much about ecology at the time because I was covering these big geopolitical events, but I had been trained in observation. And I started to study this, and we were filming this baseline study, and I became fascinated and maybe obsessed with it. And so I continue to study this 
and it's infinitely fascinating. And what I found was that human behavior had caused the degradation, and that it was understandable. The people had cut the trees, and then they went to try to do agriculture on the sides of the hills, and that, of course, eroded the fertility rapidly. And then they free-ranged goats and sheep until all of the vegetation was gone. And they passed this behavior from generation to generation, so it was a cycle of poverty and degradation. And the people in this region were somewhat depressed. They were tired and, and unhappy. And I just became fascinated with what, what had happened here. My father is Chinese, and uh, I wondered, how could you take what must have been an extremely nurturing environment and fundamentally destroy it so that it turned into a desert. I, 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 I <clears throat> became kind of fascinated with this. And of course, I was able to work with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Soil and Water Conservation, experts from the World Bank, and so on. So I had quite a lot of information. And <clears throat> in looking at this, it became clear that we're dependent on certain ecological functions. The, a very basic one is infiltration and retention of moisture. And what was happening was that there was a constant degradation of this, which took about 10,000 years to manifest as, as total collapse of a system. And that sort of depends on the robustness of the, the particular part of the earth. But it doesn't matter. If you can have a wonderful place, and if you follow the same trajectory, then you have the same result. And in China, they had 1,500 recorded incidents of flooding. And the sediments, a billion, 600 million tons annually of sediments going into the river. And this was also the cause of enormous dust storms, which not only affected China, but blew outside of China and created a, a particulate layer in the atmosphere. So these, these issues were really important. And of course, if, if that was the end of the story, it would be a very depressing story. But China was changing its, its and, and, and was working in other parts and becoming wealthy, and they decided they were going to fix this place. <laughs> and we were, we were working with them to understand what, what they were doing. They used geographic information systems to map every watershed on the plateau and give it a unique address. And with a unique address, then they could uh, uh, connect that to enterprise software. So any intervention or investment would be reflected throughout the entire management uh, of this. This was a Neolithic agricultural site. To use this type of, of technologies is very interesting. And they used econometrics. They looked at the value of ecological function in relationship to the value of the production. And they found something really important. They found that ecological function is more important, more valuable than the productivity of the region. And this allowed them to release large areas of land and those lines on the map show areas which are going to be released for natural ecological function and areas which are going to be 
intensively far. And then they engaged the entire population of the region in this activity. And they did this by explaining to them, you can't cut trees, that became illegal. You can't farm on slope lands if it can't be made, made level, if it's over 25 degrees, you have to release it to nature. And you can't free range goats and sheep. That meant the behaviors of these people were now illegal. All of their economic behaviors became illegal. They engaged them and explained what they were going to do, and they used another method to, to engage them. They paid them. Paying them worked very well. And by engaging them in this and training them, so they had really excellent experts, and by training them and paying them, they were willing to give up their negative behaviors. And they, they subsidized their work for 10 years. And at the end of this 10 years, they had completely different behaviors. And they had transformed the region. Now, th they're doing terracing here, but this was not a terracing project. This is also soil amendments. So they're actually creating new soils in here. But they did water harvesting of all kinds. They made check dams, meanders, gabions, all sorts of, of methods, and terracing. But terracing is for productivity, and they've already released perhaps 50 or 60 percent of this area for natural regeneration. So you have both natural regeneration and more modern agricultural activities. So they had everyone engaged here. They spent $500 million in an area of 35,000 square kilometers. Now this is what it looked like in 1995, and the next picture is in 2009, when we made this film for the Copenhagen COP15, which shows that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems, including ecosystems that have been historically degraded over long periods, again 1995, and then 2009. So this is not a perfect system, but this is much better than a massively degraded system. And it changes many things. It changes the behaviors of the people. So we met with illiterate Neolithic agriculturists. Their children go to universities. It changes the ecological function so that the moisture is infiltrated and retained. It protects and allows biodiversity to emerge. And it changes the productivity. So even though the, the main function was to improve ecological function, they increased productivity by reducing the area in cultivation. So, these are very powerful <laughs> concepts which haven't really been thought about. And they massively changed this, this sediment loads going into the river. In fact, the entire investment was justified simply by sediment control. Now that's a, a fascinating thing because that suggests that there are much higher returns than simply sediment control because you had four to five times increases in productivity and you have biodiversity increases and you have, you have carbon sequestration, which is exactly what we need to do to mitigate and adapt to human-induced climate change. So I got fascinated by this. And I thought, this is more important than the rise of China from poverty and isolation. I mean, I did a lovely interview with Deng Xiaoping for 60 minutes in the 1980s. No one refers to this. 
I covered Brezhnev and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Nobody cares about these things. But it also makes me think about time. We're stuck in time. We, we have the same sort of hubris that you could read about in Homer. Or, you know, human beings believe that we are very important. But the Earth is 4.5 something billion years old. And when it formed, it was a molten rock surrounded by poisonous gases. And it was transformed over prodigious time into a beautiful garden. And there are processes that we need to consider. How did this happen? Um, and the, the driver of this is photosynthesis. It's a biochemical photoreactive process that over billions of years created all the fossil fuels, for instance, scrubbed the poisonous gases from the atmosphere and made an oxygenated atmosphere. And I found three trends, which I think are very important. One is the total colonization of the planet by biological life. The second one is differentiation and speciation, leading to infinite potential variety in genetics. And the third one is the constant accumulation of organic materials as each generation of life dies and gives up its body. And this is the basis of the atmosphere. And this is the basis of the hydrological cycle. And this is the basis of nutrient release by microbial communities which take minerals and make them available to plants. And I thought, I'm a cameraman. I can't be discovering these things. And why, doesn't, why, why isn't this normal? And uh, I found also that human beings came late to this party. So I started thinking about those religious cosmologies. You know, in, in Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, Human beings emerge in paradise. And I thought about this in terms of evolutionary theory, and it's amazing. Human beings emerge in paradise. So we might want to consider this cosmology thing, because there's another part of that. Human beings sin and are cast out of paradise. What happened? And I started looking at this, and I have been fortunate to continue to follow this line of inquiry for over 20 years now. And what I found was that all the cradles of civilization went in the same way. And that the natural trends of total colonization of the planet, differentiation, speciation, leading to infinite potential variety in genetics, and the accumulation of organic materials are still, they're, they're immutable natural laws. If you break them, you're going to suffer consequences because these trends are in a different order than human, human time frame. They're over evolutionary time. And the power of these trends is continuous. And there's nothing wrong with the Earth. The problem is with human beings. And the Earth and life are not at risk. But human civilization is extremely at risk for not understanding when the Spanish went to this place in the Andes, they called this Paramo, which means wasteland, because they didn't know what it was. And it turns out that all the civilizations didn't understand what many of the plant materials, many of the different things were, so they just thought, well, we don't need those. We don't know what they are, and they started killing them. Human beings started maybe 35, 40,000 years ago to drive megafauna to extinction. 
This is ridiculous. Basically, this is ignorance. To kill something when you don't know what it is or what it does, this is not a good idea. And there are consequences for this. So if you look at the cosmology, not only did human beings emerge in paradise, not only are they kicked out of paradise, but the wages of sin is death. So looking at these long-term evolutionary trends, I got really fascinated by them because to me, they look like they are the indicators and the determinants for survival and sustainability on the planet. This is not normal. This is last, last lecture type stuff, you know. Not, uh, not normal dinner conversation. Although my family's pretty tired of me because that's all I talk about. And, but now they sort of get it. At the first, they just thought I was crazy. Um, and what I found was I'm observing two states, function and dysfunction. And that's pretty much all that there is. Functional states or dysfunctional states. And you definitely want function. Some colleagues, including those who wrote the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, have talked about uh, ecosystem services. I never talk about ecosystem services because I don't see any services. I just see function and dysfunction. And this is what I saw in the Lis Plateau, that at the time of settled agriculture, it was pristine and they started behaviors which were totally degrading the natural ecological system that led to ecosystem collapse. And this is true for any biome. But in, in this place, they made an intervention and that changed the developmental trajectory. This is very important because that's the paradigm shift which determines whether humans become conscious of these things. And restore ecological function. So if we understand this, we can survive. If we don't, we will destroy the earth. So this is not simply the history of the Lus Plateau. This is in Ethiopia, basically now. That's a few years ago, but it's happening all over the world. It's slash and burn agriculture, Neolithic agriculture, and it is if I look at this and I consider industrial agriculture, it's basically, industrial agriculture is this on steroids. So if you mechanize this, you do it the way you do it in industrial farming. This is crazy. So I can tell you exactly what this does. It will re remove the vegetative cover, will destroy the biodiversity. If original sin is the reduction of biodiversity, then it leads to this. And it's unnecessary. It's not necessary for this to happen. And this leads to poverty. And this leads to hydrological dysfunction. And this leads to climate change. And massive biodiversity loss. And basically everywhere I look in the world, I see the same thing. And we're talking about generally our political systems, our economic systems, our communication systems. We're all interested in our devices and our cell phones. And, and these are abiotic systems. And they are flawed. They are always flawed. They are always finite. And the evolutionary systems are biotic. And they are eternal. And they are immutable natural laws. Now, if, if there are any scientists among you and you would like to pursue this, I highly recommend it. They keep giving me fellowships, so there must be something about it. And uh, biodiversity loss, climate change, war, migration, they're all affected by this. 
So if we want to answer those things, those problems, the problems we're facing, look to me like symptoms. And they look like symptoms of systemic dysfunction on a planetary scale. And the only way we're going to deal with that is if we become conscious of what's wrong. And then we need to act as a species on a planetary scale. So if you think you're coming to university to get a piece of paper so that you can get a good job and outcompete the rest of your, your, your generation, you might want to rethink that. Because it doesn't look to me like the society and the economy that we're, we're experiencing now is going to be around. We are in the midst of transformational change. <laughs> and after studying for a long time natural sciences, I knew what was happening. I knew where it was happening. I knew how it was happening. I knew when it was happening. And then I wanted to know, why is it happening? And what I started to contemplate um, was that there's nothing wrong with the Earth. The natural systems are fully functional. But human beings are continuing this original sin. And they're compounding it, and they're passing it from generation to generation. And I thought about those three trends, biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter, and how important they are, and how they're just disregarded. You bulldoze away the organic layer, knock down the biology. You don't know what it is. You make a farm with monocultures. You expose the soils to the wind and the, and the rain and the sun. It's crazy. It's, it's wrong. It's ignorance. And then I look at the motivation of the society, and it's to extract and to manufacture things and to buy and sell things. And somehow the speculation between the cost price and interest-bearing debt, and this is supposed to create wealth, the fact is, we're creating poverty because we're massively rewarding a tiny minority of people and we're impoverishing billions of people at the edges of huge degraded ecosystems around the world. This is not wealth. This is poverty. And the only way you can get profit in that system is to externalize everything that makes any, that matters. You can only, if you externalize biodiversity loss, climate change, toxicity, health implications, poverty, war, disparity, then you have profit. And uh, sadly, this worldview, in the modern sense, is coming from Holland. and Europe, and it's been imposed on indigenous people around the world. And if you ask those people about their worldview, they would say that every living thing is sacred. But their societies have been disrupted through slavery, through imperialism, through colonization, and through the ex expansion of mercantilism after the Industrial Revolution. And I learned something in Mali. Now, Mali is 1,200,000 square kilometers. That's approximately the size of France and Spain combined. And there are 14 million people. That's approximately the population of Los Angeles. And according to the human development indicators, they're the poorest people on the earth. So I went there with 
the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Wetlands International, and what I found was a unique ecological system. The waters come out of the Ghanaian highlands, and they flood the entire central part of Mali up to six meters every year. I've been to Bangladesh in the Delta where the Meghna and the Brahmaputra meet. I've been to the, to the uh, Everglades. But this is astonishing and unique on the Earth. And what is happening when, when waters rise six meters to make a huge inland sea and then recede every year? And then they rise and they recede and they rise and they recede. Well, if you go to the NASA um, animations of satellite imagery, you can see what's happening. This is the hydrological regulation, the release of water between the tropics of Capricorn and the tropic of Cancer. And it's circulating, circulating around the Earth. Now, what do you think is the value of natural hydrological and climate regulation at a time when we are afraid of human-induced climate change that could cause the, our extinction? How could those people be the poorest people on Earth and how could we be asking them to degrade their system in order to buy a cell phone or a pair of tennis shoes or a bicycle? If we got this right, we'd have to understand that these are the richest people on the earth. That these systems are required for life. So essentially what we've done is we've inflated derivatives We've said that wealth is coming from extraction, manufacturing, and buying and selling things. In that scenario, to have growth, you have to extract more. You have to manufacture more. You have to sell more. And it won't work because you only have finite resources. So you can't infinitely grow using finite resources. It's impossible. And it's immoral because we know it comes from divine right, and it comes from slavery, and it comes from imperialism and colonization and mercantile expansion after the Industrial Revolution. And that's not a judgment. That's just a fact. So how could we deal with that? How could we change that? We saw that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. This seems to me to be a completely different purpose than the idea that we're supposed to buy and sell things, or that the, the guy who dies with the most stuff wins. I don't think the guy who dies with the most stuff wins. In fact, that person might be an unhappy person. I've seen people in Mali who are supposedly the poorest people in, on the earth, and their children crawl into my arms and give me an enormous hug, and I get a lot of energy from this. And what is the value of natural ecosystem function now in this analysis, in the worldview that comes from divine rights, slavery, imperialism, colonization, it's zero. Well, it can't be zero. So I think that alone makes, makes the worldview that we have now false. It can't be true. It's fundamentally corrupt and corrupting. And we need to understand that. And the biodiversity the biomass, the accumulated organic matter, that's the determinant for human survival and sustainability. And now, that's supposed to be zero. It can't be true. It's not true. So, 
in my travels all over the world, <clears throat> I've seen that these natural systems, excuse me, are more valuable. than the shiny objects we're marketing and that end up on the trash heap within a few years, they're always less valuable. And ecosystem function is more valuable, but it's not reflected in our economy today. And this means we need to change. We need to meditate on this. It's not up to an individual to decide what happens. Human civilization is progressing. We've come to this part, and now we need to make some hard decisions. Because if we continue on the path we're on, we're going to collapse the planet, planetary systems. We have climate change, biodiversity loss, massive toxicity. We have poverty and disparity at a time when there's seven and a half billion people and we're adding a billion people every 12 years. It cannot work. So I would say we're at a turning point in human history. This is not the first time, but I've been watching transformational change my entire adult life. China was poor and isolated in 1979 when I first went there. And the Soviet Union was considered to be a huge, powerful thing. They're gone. I think this is like flat earth, round earth, where you have something which is fundamentally false. There are laws and institutions which support it, but it cannot ultimately be justified. It's similar to slavery. Slavery was legal you could buy and sell human beings. And somehow, that was tried to be, that was justified. But eventually, it became an untenable position. Try going out in the market and selling a human being. You can't do it. And that's where we are now. The, hu the global economy that we have at the moment is unworkable. And so taking a position in the existing system is not going to be an option for you. You're going to have to design and make something else. And you can do it a lot better. And you can make it a lot more fair. And you can make it sustainable. And it has to happen. So you need to embrace transformational change. You need to realize this is the great work of our time. The generations who are alive today have something to do. We're not supposed to extract and buy and sell things. We're not consumers. We're human beings. And we need to act like that. We need to realize ignorance and greed comes out with a certain outcome. We have lots of data, thousands of years of data of what ignorance and greed does. What happens if you act with consciousness and generosity. I wonder what that looks like. In the 20th century, we had a interesting uh, examples. Gandhi. Gandhi brought down not simply the British Empire. He brought down the idea that colonization was possible. Nelson Mandela spent decades in prison, and I can't think of a more disgusting social organization than apartheid, and he came out and he forgave his oppressors. Now, what, what I think these, these things mean is nonviolence is more powerful than violence, ultimately. So right now, we're in a period where there are some very serious violent episodes taking place around the world. We need to deal with this. You need to deal with this. And 
We need to change the intention of society. Because if I was a, an adolescent or post-adolescent male and I'd been humiliated for years and years, I'd be a very dangerous person. A very dangerous person. But I've lived in privilege my whole life. And I see that privilege as a responsibility. And we need to make this right. And we better do it really fast. Common land is a foundation that's dedicated to restoring ecological function on a planetary scale. I'm kind of philosophical when I've been looking at the science. They're very practical, and they're figuring out how to do this. And there are already projects in Spain, in Australia, and in South Africa. I recommend you go look at commonland.com. But there is a new level of business, and there is a para paradigm shift that we need to realize and we need to embrace, and it's transformation of the society. How many people are happy, really happy, with, with what they, they have? So you see people who, are, who now have tremendous amounts of money, but you also see a lot of depression, a lot of alcoholism, drug addiction, and suicide. If you've looked at the, uh, looked at the situation with the American military, do you know what is the highest cause of mortality in the American military. They've been going into these wars. It's suicide. The young people who come back can't live with themselves anymore. They're broken. This is tragic. This is a technique called doom stabilization. You just put straw into the ground, and then whatever moisture there is follows the straw into the ground, it begins to degrade. And then seeds blow up, or birds land there and leave the seeds, and it revegetates. This is needed at the edge of the Sahel. At the, you can do this, the Chinese do this now. And if we look at this and we say, well, what is the value of the productivity in comparison with the value of the function? Then we're starting to learn the lessons of the Liss Plateau. The Chinese saw that the ecological function was vastly more valuable than the productivity. Well, that brings up a question. What is money? Where does it come from? Is it shells and beads and rocks, or what is it? Does it really come from extraction, manufacturing, buying and selling things, speculating between the cost price of commodities and interest-bearing debt? No, that's a corrupt and corrupting system. And there's another way, which is to base our economy and our money on ecological function. Because this is real wealth. This is where the atmosphere, the climate regulation, the fertility in the soil, the food we need to feed seven and a half billion people and adding a billion people every 12 years comes from. And if we don't do this, then we're going to face some very serious consequences immediately. And all over the world, I've now spoken in every continent, and this message is not rejected in the Middle East or in Asia or in South America, or in Africa. And it's kind of embraced even in Europe and North America, because we don't have a lot of options.
climate change is, is changing. The, this is the end of the fossil fuel era. We haven't completely realized it yet, but it's over. You can't burn pure photosynthesis, pure energy that, that was photosynthesized over hundreds of millions of years and a hundred years without consequences. It's over. It's done. And we don't need it anyway. We didn't need it when it started, but the marketing, the idea that mercantilism was, was made sense is what caused that to happen. So I think that we have to realize that the future, we are making the future. We can't do anything about the past. It happened. All these things happened. You might want to consider that Europe in the last few hundred years was acting very similar to the Mongols or to the Vikings. And that was what was going on. And now the consequence is that you have large degraded ecosystems and disabled, uh, you know, just sad societies in degraded, degraded systems. There's some karma. There's some responsibility in this. There's responsibility in privilege. And there's responsibility in knowledge. And knowledge is not a commodity. Knowledge is a right. And we have the ability to make the sum of human knowledge available to every human being on the planet instantaneously and simultaneously. And it's a duty. Because if we do this, we can go to the next level of human civilization. And if we don't, we're going to destroy the earth. So that's what I had to say to you. And... Uh, I'm easy to find if you want to talk to me. I have my email. It's not working very well, so I need a wizard. But uh, we have a little time for questions, if you have any. So thanks for listening. I can speak up too. Uh, okay. Yeah, you want to? Yeah. Um, maybe it's a little bit personal question, but you talked about, you know, us human beings destroying the earth and things like that, but then you're flying all over the place to, like, you know, visit these places. And do you feel bad personally about it? Do I feel bad about flying? Yeah. Well, let's see. When I take a flight, they ask me to fill out a little thing and say $25 would sequester the carbon that uh, you know that would be equal to to my to, to the carbon that I'm personally expending in the flight. In 2006, I went to Rwanda for the first of 13 trips to Rwanda. And they rewrote their land use policy laws and connected their economic development to ecological restoration. And 27,000 square kilometers are being restored. I'm not too worried about my carbon footprint right now. I think if I didn't go, it would be irresponsible. I hope you don't go. And I was just wondering what do you think we could do to help remedy this whole situation? Which, which situation are you talking about? The thing that you talked to in your whole lecture, the reforestation, what could we do to help? Well, um, I think we need to have a, a profound conversation about what is true and what is not true. So. Right now, we have a, a global economic system which is corrupt and corrupting. And it comes from generations of abuse 
it allows generations of abuse, and it's impossible to continue. So one year ago, I heard uh, Al Gore talking about the oil reserves and the fossil fuel reserves. And he said, we can't burn the existing known fossil fuel reserves because we will definitely go beyond catastrophic levels of, of climate change. Now this is quite interesting because it means the industrial or the, the valuations of industrial companies are not true because they're based on their, their, their valuations. At that time, the oil price was over $100 a barrel. It lost three quarters of its, of its value. I don't know how much that is. It, but, you know, this is not true. The, the economy is not true. You can't make all this food and then throw it away. And you can't make more and more cell phones and more and more fashion items what plastic care things or whatever, and think that this is creating wealth. It's creating pollution. It's creating waste. It's creating a consumption society. That's not what we need at this time. We need to, to realize, well, that's not a very evolved you know, point of view. We need to realize we're human beings. We've been evolving. We have some technology, we have some understanding, but it's not very much. You know, a hundred years from now, our knowledge will look, our lovely technologies. Remember when you got the first, I, you, I don't know how, I, the first hard drive I got was 20 megabytes. An external hard drive of 20 megabytes? You know, we have to realize that, that, and now, where are those things? Huge piles of ancient, you know, now they're not even ancient, just a few years ago. Crap, it's all junk. This is not where value is. Value is in natural biotic systems, and we need to restore those biotic systems. So you need to think about, it. what is your purpose? Your purpose now needs to be restore those systems. It needs to be create a society that, you know, vote for the people who, who want to do this, install people, have a profound conversation. Yes? Uh, what is your point of view towards uh, modern agriculture? Like in America and Europe, that we use um, very modern, sophisticated machines to farm our fields. And is there a problem to be solved with that? I would say that that type of agriculture was not created by an agricultural scientist. It was created by a Neanderthal with a sharpened stick. And essentially what the Neanderthal did was he saw a seed pod and it had lots of seeds hanging off of it. And then he saw these other plants and he didn't know what they were for, he didn't want them. And so he took his sharpened stick and he started to kill those other plants. And then he started to represent these seeds, and he did two things at once. He created plowing and monocultures. Both are ridiculous. If you expose the soils to the sun, the wind, and the rain, first of all, you get UV radiation, which sterilizes the microbiologic habitat. That can't be right. The microbes created the pedosphere, they transformed the lithosphere into the pedosphere that created the fertility that released nutrients to plants. You know, sterilizing their habitat is not correct. It also allows for wind erosion and water erosion. It changes the infiltration and retention of moisture. Look at the Mediterranean. Look at North Africa. Look at the Sahel. Look at Central Asia. They, these are dehydrated biomes. So if you think those types of biomes are more productive 
than a functional ecosystem, then follow that line of agriculture. But if you go to a food forest and you see, oh my goodness, there's like all this biodiversity hanging off everywhere, and you can eat virtually you know, most of it, especially if you design it, then of course it's much more productive. Natural systems. Basically what I found in my research is that productivity follows function. Function is primary. Production is secondary. It's a derivative that only comes from functional systems. So modern agriculture is an at, you know is, is terrible. It's de it's destroying the, the earth. It's destroyed many things already. Okay, we already had a question back here. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I had a question. Um, Recently, we see the development of companies becoming more societally responsible. Can you hear me? Uh, speak up. And okay. And companies becoming more societally responsible. Do you think that this has the potential to create this transitional phase? Um, I guess to a to a better to a better um, society, to a better world, to be becoming more responsible with, with products and technology. Do you get my question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yes. I think I think corporations and the people who work in corporations need to consider who they are and what they're doing. And you know, but I think that there is a there there are some people who think well let's take small steps and do things which are less bad. Well, I'm not sure that that's going to work. I think we're in a transformational stage. And what you're going to see is that we have only two choices. We have the choice of moving to the round earth or the post-slavery situation. And, uh, or we see major collapses in ecology. So if you look at um, if you look at uh, what's happening, I mean, how, how when 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 is it going to be enough? So if you have hurricanes which take out entire cities, or you have increases in flooding, or increases in drought, or increases in in uh, species die out, when when do you say, well, that's enough? Is it when there's an earthquake and a tsunami that takes out a, you know, bunch of nuclear power plants and turns vast areas into radioactive waste and people can't live there anymore? And you know, or do you need more? You know, is it just going to keep going? Don't you think that um, that the, the gradual process could lead to the desired outcome that we all want? Or do you think it necessarily has to be this major shift? Yeah, I think, it, I think it probably has to be a major shift. I mean, when I, when I covered the collapse of the Soviet Union, I didn't think, I mean, nobody thought the Soviet Union was going to go away. Um, when I first went to China, nobody thought China was going to be a world power. They thought it was, uh, you know, not, not, not strong. Um, we, we need to look at what is real. We need we need the kind of character that the Chinese showed because they're survivors. They took extremely difficult decisions. They made these decisions and they made policies which reflected what is right. Um, and they did it. So we need that. And now we're, we're sitting here and, uh, you know, the economy is false. I can't, I can't, nothing that I see suggests that guys snorting cocaine on Wall Street, you know, trading hedge funds, doing whatever they're doing, is, is really creating wealth. It's not creating wealth, it's, it's giving them vast sums of, of money, but it's leaving billions of people in poverty and, and contributing to the degradation of <coughs> vast areas of the planet. And that breeds social unrest where adolescent males and 
post-adolescent males think getting a gun or a bomb is acceptable. And, you know, that actually, that actually, you know, looks like a strategy for them. Because if they're just going to be humiliated, we need to realize that it says in the American Constitution that we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all, let's paraphrase, all human beings, I could even go further and say all living things, all living beings, are created equal and endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. Well, that's not reflected in the behaviors that we see or in the economy that we see right now. And it should be, because even though that was written by a guy who had slaves in Virginia, it doesn't make it less true. Are there any other questions? I was wondering, there are um, some notions in our society that, for example, our economy is based on, uh, some very fundamental ones. But of course, as you say, uh, if in 12 years we add a billion people to our population, those are not very sustainable. So what do you think would happen to our conception of uh, ownership of property, let's say, in 50 to 100 years? Well, you know, I, I don't think it's up to an individual to design the economy or the society. I research function and dysfunction in terrestrial ecosystems and it definitely looks to me like ecosystem function is vastly more valuable than anything that, that has ever been produced by human beings or anything that will ever be produced by human beings and that is not reflected in the economy. So that's my observation and I, I think my con con contribution to a societal conversation about this. Now, I would also add that there are societies around the world who for many thousands of years believed that it was impossible to own the earth because our lifespan, we, we, we die and we give up our bodies and our bodies are reincorporated into the earth and that they believe and they continue to believe that all life is sacred. I tend to agree with them that all life is sacred and the idea that individuals can buy it and especially the idea that I stole it and it's mine, you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. You know, so if you go with a giant gun over to, and you say, well, your country is my country. You know, what? You, what? What are you talking about exactly? And, you know, okay, you can kill somebody. You can kill generations of people. You can make it work for a couple of hundred years. But at some point, you're going to have to face the truth that that's a lie. That's killing. That's stealing. And I stole it and it's mine doesn't work very well. It's like defending the flat earth. And so you can't defend it. And that's not like a judgment exactly because there's nothing to be done about these things. It's more about what kind of future do we want? Do you want your children and your children's children to have to face this because we didn't? And, you know, I don't think that works very well for me. So, you know, it's a societal conversation. It's trying to find what's right. It's trying to find what do we believe. We don't believe that it's possible to buy and sell human beings in the public market right now. Well, that's progress. We don't believe that you can take a big gun and go, well, some people do apparently, but, but you know, you can't easily... Uh, argue that you can go and, and forcefully take over another country and now it's your country. Although there's violence all over the place. So it needs to be discussed. And we don't need to just be entertained. We don't need to, it's not a video game. It's reality. And there are millions of people who are suffering at this time. And there's a duty to, to 
to deal with it in the society. And probably those people who are most affected, they're unable to deal with it. They're fleeing for their lives. You know. So those people who are not fleeing for their lives, they're the ones who are going to have to deal with it. Because the ones who are fleeing for their lives and the ones and you know, if you look at the like the, the people who are participating in this, they're also victims. You know, the when I go and see the the veterans who come back to the United States from from Afghanistan or Iraq, these are very damaged people. They're homeless. They're they they they've been irradiated. They have uh, you know, they sat on boxes of depleted uranium for weeks or months, and their children have birth defects. And you know, it's, it's horrible. The whole thing is just ridiculous. So, you know, to me, wealth is sitting under the fig tree, drinking lemonade with family and friends, and you know, and we have to make that possible for every human being on the planet.